Adam, if product design was a Tex-Mex delicacy, you would be a deep fried chimichanga with a gut wrenching combination of jalapenos and dried sour cream. Bring on the dried sour cream. Welcome to Engineer vs. Designer. The podcast. For designers, engineers, makers, bakers, and people who have written over 150 books on the topic of design, I am Adam. And I am Josh. As always, we'll be making an elegant noodle paste straight from the ground brain grain of our fortunate guest. This week, we talk with another famous author, design entrepreneur expert, and former art director of the New York Times Book Review, Mr. Stephen Heller. We'll start with a design history lesson before that, courtesy of SolidSmack.com, and then jump straight into our convo with the masterful Steve-O, as we like to call him. We are on a fake name basis with Steve. Speaking of which, Josh, <laughs> sharpen your prisma colors and color our monochromatic minds with your rainbow rays of knowledge. What have you got for us this week? Ah, this episode of Engineer vs. Designer is brought to you by CAD Junkie. From SOLIDWORKS to Moto to Rhino, learn CAD for industrial design. Learning CAD for industrial design just got so much easier. For a free membership, head over to CADJunkie.com. Now... We have, in fact, sent out a tweet for this episode on the Twitter. As we are wont to do. Yeah, anyone who retweets that message will be entered into a drawing for a soft and cottony Engineer uh-huh. vs. Designer t-shirt. Show off that rib cage, baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, last week's winner is mm-hmm. Andrew Eit. Congrats, Andrew. You could be next. Head over to yep. twitter.com slash evd1 and retweet away. Now, Stephen Heller is our guest this week. I don't even know where to start with what he's done. He is currently the co-chair of the MFA Designer as Author Department at New York School of Visual Arts. Mm -hmm. He's a former art director for the New York Times Book Review, a contributing editor for many design magazines, and uh, as we mentioned, has written over 150 books just on the subject of design, including books on writing for design and design entrepreneurship. And because Steve (sighs) is such a uh, respected author, we're going to share with you an overview of an article he wrote for Print Magazine on the history of the paper coffee cup. That's true. Let's go. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, sharing a drinking vessel, usually a tin cup, was pretty common. Mm. But at that time, public health overall was uh, not fantastic, and disease was rampant, and uh, this drink-sharing thing probably wasn't helpful. Quite. Introduced in 1907 by a Boston lawyer by the name of Lawrence Lulin, the first paper cup was designed to curb the spread of germs, especially on railroad trains, where passengers drank from water barrels or taps using a common cup. So he teamed up with inventor Hugh Moore and also developed an ice-cooled water vending machine with disposable cups to even further Ah. deter the spread of germs. Yeah, and together they launched a campaign to market the machine and educate the public on its health benefits. With the 1917 flu pandemic that claimed millions of lives, uh, Lewin's health cup, renamed to the Dixie Cup, would alter Ah. Western behavior forever. Later, that Dixie logo would find its way on cups featured in the 40s and 50s movies where characters drank that takeout coffee. Delicious. Design-wise, not much has changed since 1963 when the Anthora paper cup was uh, introduced. It remains an iconic staple at Greek-owned coffee shops throughout New York City. Mm -hmm. By the 1980s, paper cups gave way to those styrofoam cups with plastic lids, Mostly light with the subtle little design elements. And finally, by the 1990s, when carbon footprints became a hot topic, the styrofoam Mm. cup became a relic of the past, much to the chagrin of my dad and sister, who still get really bitter about (laughs) that, and (laughs) was replaced by paper yet again, which today you'll see in myriad styles, sizes, and varying degrees of environmentally conscious materials. Uh, You know, all this paper cup talk uh, makes me want some coffee. Mm -hmm. Just, uh... Just skip the just cup, go, though. Just straight from... Straight my yeah. mouth. Yeah. Pot to mouth. Straight... <laughs> Pour the beans. <laughs> straight in. I mean, I, I, this morning, I actually ate... Water, um, coffee bag. This morning, I actually done. took a bunch of unground uh, dark roast espresso beans, poured milk on them, and ate them like cereal. Just nod just it. Eat, just, just eat it. Crunch, crunch. It's, it's really satisfying. <laughs> Stephen Heller, thank you so much for joining us today. Our first question is uh, one that may be life-altering for you. If you had the power to get anywhere in New York uh, with no traffic, you could go anywhere you want, Uh, but in order to do that, you had to ride on a Segway wearing a pink tutu, would you do that? Uh, You know, I don't think I would 
ride on a Segway. I think they're worse than pink tutus. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Not surprising. You, know, right. you could get away with wearing a pink tutu, but everybody yeah, that's thinks right. you're an ass if you uh, ride a. <laughs> get that guy. All right. <laughs> well, Stephen Stephen Heller, you you work at uh, the MFA program at the School of Visual Arts in New York. I'm is that the right? co-chair of the School of Visual Arts MFA Designer as Author and Entrepreneur Program. Can you tell us anything about that? What, what's that all about? Well, we're the first program in the U.S. to. Uh, emphasize that designers can be entrepreneurs, and we've done this. This is going to be our 15th year. Nice. And so students have to create uh, products that go into the marketplace. Some of them use that as uh, uh, an equity for themselves that starts off their career. Some of them use it as a way of starting a new business, and we've had some successful projects. Wow. Now, and, and in, in addition to that, you are a prolific author, and your most recent book uh, I believe you have a new book come out. Is that, is that right? I have a few at any given time, but the one I'm most keen on at the moment is 100 Ideas That Changed Graphic Design, published by Lawrence King. I love that idea. Uh, can you tell us anything about it? What, what's, uh, what, why should we buy that book? Well, we were asked. I, uh, I co-authored it with Veronique Vienne, uh, a French design critic and historian, and we picked uh, tw- uh, 100 ideas uh, that... Uh, had some impact on the evolution of design in the 20, 21st century. Hmm. I love the idea of that book. Now, you, you have had a long history, a very long history of writing, serving as contributor, editor. Where, uh, where are you from, first of all, and what first sparked that interest in writing? Well, I'm from right where I'm sitting, basically. I, I was born uh-huh. around the corner from my office, which is uh, the east side oh, nice. of Manhattan and below 23rd Street. Uh, I was born here when I was a little baby and uh, <laughs> grew up and lived basically in the same, more or less the same neighborhood. So it's kind of like being in a small town in the middle uh-huh. of New York City. Huh. Uh, I got uh-huh. involved with writing because I went to uh, NYU and took English before they kicked me out. And then I came to the School of <laughs> Visual Arts where they kicked me out as well. And uh, I always liked writing and as well as designing. I, I do have a, another book out called uh, Writing and Des- Researching for the Graphic Designer. And in it, I say, uh, writing is design. Hmm. Can, expound on that a little bit. What, what do you mean, writing is design? Well, when you write, you're setting out a uh, blueprint for a narrative, for a story. And uh, it is akin to doing uh, design, except you're... With design, you're working with a visual language, and here you're working with verbal language, mm. but the verbal language at its best is creating mind pictures. So uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we make this, this arbitrary distinction between words and pictures because they are in different formats, but essentially, conceptually, they're the same thing. Right. A written word is, a, is kind of a little pictogram, isn't it? It is indeed. So, so you're, you are a renaissance man. You, you've written or been involved in the development of, I believe, over 130 books. You can correct me if I'm wrong. You are uh, also co-founder of that MFA program at SVA in New York. You're also editor of the AIGA Journal of Graphic Design. Um, do, you, do you sleep at night? Actually, I, I'm, not, I'm not editor <laughs> of the AIGA Journal anymore. Uh, okay. So All right. So, so, so now you actually get those pl- precious three hours of sleep now. Right, and it's 150 books. Good grief. How, so seriously, from a logistical standpoint, how, d- <laughs> from a logistical how does your life work? work what do you do? I work with a lot of great people. You know, you can't, uh, you can't do anything anymore without collaboration. I mean, you two are collaborating, right? You're one voice, but you're two people. And uh, hmm. so putting together a team is essential. And, you know, sometimes the word team is overused, but I think, in, certainly in the digital age, uh, you, need, you can't have the single genius anymore. You can have somebody who has the vision or somebody who takes the steering wheel or somebody who captains the ship, but the ship still needs a lot of people. And uh, many of my collaborators who I might hire as a researcher or a designer, I'll often make into a co-author and put them on the cover of the book, in part because I can't pay them very well. But... The other part is, you know, they're essential to the success of any project. Uh So Mm -hmm. those books, they cover uh, just a wide 
array of topics from illustration to graphic design, uh, product design also. Uh, is there one discipline that you prefer over the other? Well, uh, graphic design is where I've hung my right. hat for all these years. So, uh, But the what I am most interested in is not so much a discipline as it is a theme that uh, encompasses graphic design, product design, architecture, mm. uh, popular uh. culture in many ways, and that's how... Uh, uh, propaganda is propagated. <laughs> right, right. Now, in, in you were talking about you know writing and uh, and writing being akin to design, and uh, you know wh- one of your more recent releases, writing and research for graphic designers, centers around that craft of writing for business and criticism in the design world. Um, I'm an industrial designer, however, and I think that this is every bit as applicable to me as it is to any graphic designer. Would would you agree that what you're writing about is is kind of more universal than than you know the the narrow, relatively narrow field of graphic design? Oh, definitely. Uh, but this is a book that is seeking out a market, and our market happened to be design designers and mm. design students. But every uh, design practice has to be communicative. And you, as a product designer, industrial designer, uh, you need to be able to explain what you're doing. It's not good enough just to say it's instinctive. Mm-hmm. It's not good enough to uh, uh, mm-hmm. say you got to feel it with me, uh, because clients don't <laughs> necessarily want to feel things. They want uh. some validation for what they're going to be investing in. But that all said, words are part of our vocabulary. In fact, most of our vocabulary. So. Uh, <laughs> to be able to use them well or even just use them competently is uh, a big plus. I can't spell worth uh-huh. a damn, though. And uh, I recently saw a tweet that said, I love the new book by Heller, but boy, those typos. So maybe the next edition should be called <laughs> Writing, uh, Researching, and uh, Copy Editing for Graphic Designer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, uh uh, wow, 33 years you were art director at the New York Times, uh, art, art director of the book review section, and uh, right now you're writing the visuals column for that same section. What uh, period were you working uh, as the art director uh, for that column, and uh, how have you seen that the design world change as a whole since then? Well, I've, I've started working there after I was art director of Screw Magazine. And uh, I actually came to the Times as art director of the op-ed page and then moved over to the book review. So it was quite a while that I was doing it. It started in 1974, and it ended about three years ago. Uh, the, um, what I've seen in terms of change is often stylistic, uh, but the real change was technological. When I started working at the Times, when I started working in publishing, period, um, there was no such thing as uh, a computer, no such thing as uh, digital type. You know, the technology has altered a great deal of what we do, how we do it, and uh, that can't be underestimated. Would you say uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge that phrase? Does has technology changed what you do? I mean, clearly it's changed how you do it. I think but has it also changed the practice of the practice of design itself with a big D? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it may not have changed people of my generation, but it has changed subsequent generations. You know, it used to be you mm. could sit down and sketch out ideas and waste a lot of paper coming up with something that was iterative. And now you can do the same iterations, I suppose, on the computer, but it's a different kind of hand to material experience. It's not a better one. It's not a worse one. It's just a different one, and I think different solutions occur given the, the technologies that you have. I mean, every so often you'll see when the, like flying logos, when flying logos were in vogue, uh, it was because there was a machine that enabled uh, people, particularly broadcasters, to make those. Mm-hmm. Uh, when shiny logos were in, in vogue, it was because there was a filter on the computer that allowed you to make those sheens and shines. So, you know, these things come and go. Sometimes they stay a little bit longer than others. Uh, But how and what, I think, are the uh, two significant words. 
I was just, uh, I'm wondering, do you have a favorite memory as an art director? Lunch. Uh, <laughs> a yeah, getting away a... from the office is always a, always, <laughs> always a good, good place to be. No, I so, actually, I do have, I have lots and lots of memories, although my mind is, uh, my memory is failing me a lot lately. But one of my memories was working with uh, Richard Avedon when I was on the op-ed page, and it was near the end of the Vietnam War, and working at a newspaper, particularly the New York Times, during times like that were very exciting. And uh, we asked Richard Avedon to give us a photograph that would somehow uh, sum up the Vietnam War, and he had taken this long, narrow picture that spread across the entire width of a page uh, of all the members of the War Council, which included uh, Henry Kissinger and the, the Se Secretary of Defense and, and others who were key uh, conspirators in the Vietnam War, and I use that word deliberately. Um, so working with him was fascinating because he was a perfectionist, and the newspaper is an imperfect vehicle, f or it was at any rate, for reproducing photographs. So mm. I spent at least eight hours with him getting... Uh, multiple cuts made of the uh, picture that he, uh, we ultimately used. And he, of course, wanted not to leave the photograph there. That was very important to him. And ultimately, I sent him the plate that it right, you know, right. That produced from. Uh, so that was one of, one of many wonderful experiences. Now, we uh, spend a lot of time talking on this show about the rise of uh, what some people are calling personal manufacturing, people having, you know, uh, less and less expensive 3D printers in their houses, shop bots, different things where they can make stuff at home much more easily, download files and, and make them real. There was a whole lot of very similar hype and hubbub around, you know, uh, digital publishing when it first started getting big and people being able to print things at home. Clearly, you know, that hasn't uh, replaced the offset press, but you know, web design, on the other hand, kind of has, where a lot of, you know, people are able to start websites and design them all on their own without a big team of people. Um, how, how do these technologies affect the way that we think about design? And do you think that helps or hurts or, or you know, is just a wash? Well, it's a complex question. And I think that uh, just stepping back to your mention of offset printing, uh, I've, right. I was talking a few days ago to people who were involved in uh, Offset, and they think that'll be gone very soon. In fact, mm. uh, publishing on demand, printing on demand. Well, but they'll still be doing digital they'll offset. They'll be doing though, right? digital. They'll be doing uh, uh, digital printing for sure. But it, it, it does change things because anybody who wants to be a publisher can be a publisher now and get really good books in the, in the bargain. Whereas you used mm. to wait and wait, as I do with my books. I mean, there, I go through traditional publishing means, and it takes forever. Even my ebook that's out now took forever. It, it was an original ebook rather than just a pickup of PDFs. And I think that um, you know the QuickBot or the MakerBot is very much the same thing. If you can make something in your own home and sell it, you've become a business. And mm -hmm. uh, our, our conception of what making is and of what selling is and of what retailing is uh, will change considerably. And over so, well, and let me, let me jump in there as well and, and just throw in there also kind of this kind of arbitrary separation that we've had for the last hundred years or so between, uh, between the act of designing or conceiving of something and then the act of making it and selling it. Um, because of industrialism, industrialism, we've we've kind of separated those things, but um, that's not necessarily a distinction we should make. But you know, we're having all these issues with uh, with intellectual quote unquote property, for example. And as a designer, the thing the thing that you're creating isn't the physical article, right? It's not the physical book that you're selling. Uh, you're selling the ideas in it, right? And if people can, you know, if that becomes if the, if the book is no longer needed as a vehicle, how do you feel about your intellectual property and how, you know, how that uh, market works? Well, that's why we run this MFA program. It's about entrepreneurship, which means you own the entire uh, work. You own your ideas. You own your, your platform, or at least you rent your platform. Uh, hmm. But you have more control over the entire product. And anybody who's 
seen work on Etsy or any of the other uh, uh, selling services online, we'll see that designers are becoming cottage industries. So now, on they, that, they are not selling their their wares to somebody else. They're selling direct to the public, and therefore they're able to uh, price it differently and collect on it differently. It now, also means that things are out there and can be stolen very easily. Mm-hmm. Now, on that note, uh, you've, you've got a book that covers this, The Design Entrepreneur, uh, Turning Graphic Design into Goods That Sell, uh, and it uh, centers around innovators who step out of the traditional design role and, and get into their own business. Uh, you're starting to get into this. What, from your experience, does it take to make it as a design entrepreneur in uh, 2013? In 2013, a design entrepreneur, it should go without saying, can design. It should also go without That's... saying, can conceive. But what doesn't go without saying is they need to know business. And so it's mm. that, it's not that ultimate marriage of business, conception, fabrication, uh, and promotion. Uh, a couple of those things come naturally to designers, and a couple of those things you know, have to be force-fed. But if you have all of those things, the odds are much better that you will be entrepreneurial. Because uh, it's one thing to have a great idea. It's another thing to make it happen. Otherwise, it's just a great idea. And you've heard many times, I'm sure, I had that idea, but somebody else beat me to it. And that's designers have the ability to go right for the jugular uh, in a much quicker way than somebody who doesn't have the design skills and has, has to go out and hire a freelancer. What would be your number one piece of advice for uh, people who haven't had that business training, that background, and they keep having these ideas? Uh, what would you advise those people to do? So aside from applying to our program, I'd say right. get those <laughs> skills. You know, where do you get those skills? There are different ways. You know, we could take a whole program to itemize them. But oh, yeah. uh, the bottom line is get over the fact that business is not just you know a, a capitalist tool. Business is a means of uh, putting ideas into the public sphere and and making something off of it because people who have great ideas and can't support them financially, if they're unsustainable, then they're bad ideas. Now, you know, I, I would, I wonder, Josh and I, for example, are both working from offices uh, in or near our homes. Uh, we, we both work, uh, we're both independent and, and work for companies from, from our own offices. And that seems to be increasingly a popular way to work. But it definitely comes with some problems, particularly for designers. Uh, I know for myself, uh, especially, I know I have trouble being creative uh, in isolation. Do you, do you think that increasingly designers will not work in traditional offices? And then if so, is, is that a problem? Well, I think it is a problem uh, for the very reason you say. I mean, you need that other stimulation, if nothing else, just to keep you awake. But uh, I, I, what I see are communes forming, not in the hip. Mm. Uh, right, but right. I see collaboratives, and there there are some in certain of the design professions already. There are incubators where people just hang out and make and make and make. Google, mm-hmm. uh, you know, their their uh, R and D department is just a bunch of tables with computers where people are just making things and passing them back and forth, either physically or digitally. I think uh, ultimately there's going to be that kind of uh, making environment. And the people who are stuck in their studios solo are going to want to get out and take part in some of it. I mean, you do need Hmm. space and time away from other people. Everybody does. Uh, But I think that collaborative environment uh, is the wave of the future. Okay, Stephen. uh, With everything you've done in the past few decades, uh, everything that you're doing today, where do you see yourself in the next five years? Well, I hope not in a coffin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I hope so too, Stephen. You don't sound that old, so I'm not I'm not that concerned about that. But uh, in the next five years, I don't know. Quite honestly, I I hope that uh, you know I'm not that old, and I hope that uh, I'll be able to uh, adjust in the same way I've adjusted over the last 35, 40 years. Uh, uh-huh. I still love doing books, so I'd like to be able to do them. But if something comes uh, my way that uh, 
breaks that kind of traditional or conventional mode, I'm happy to join in. I, you know, I used to think I would be writing for print publications all my life, and then the uh, yeah. internet came. And the fact is, I enjoy writing for the internet journals I write for almost as much, if not more, than the print ones because of the immediacy. Huh. Well, and possibly because of the feedback as well. It's kind of, uh, you, you have a two-way connection with your audience. You have a two-way connection. Way, right? Sometimes that connection is uh, pretty staticky, uh, depending on the yeah. both. That yeah, are, definitely. Are responding to you. But, um, and the nice people that are responding to you. But yes. it, it, <laughs> it is an interesting democratization of uh, what we do. Instead of sitting on our Mount Olympuses, we're really down in the pits with everybody else. Yeah. Do you have a, a favorite uh, design entrepreneurship success story? Well, my favorite story is one that came out of this program, and that is Deborah Adler, who uh, created the uh, Target dr prescription drug package. Oh, uh, right, of course. Ago. Yeah. And it started uh, as uh, actually... But she was working with Milton Glaser. She right? was working with Milton, who was teaching here and still is. Uh, she mm -hmm. was a student here, and she had come to us with... Uh, uh, a project to um, do some hair hair uh, straightener. She has curly hair, and that was going to be her product. We always uh -huh. insist that the students work from autobiography first. What is it that they would like to see out in the world? And mm -hmm. then um, the next week after we approved her hair straightener, uh, she came in and said, my grandmother almost died taking the wrong medicine. It's because those crappy medicine bottles those round things with the yellow <laughs> or orange uh, plastic, they're just incomprehensible. And she, in the course of that week, or less even, came up with a whole plan on how to restructure and uh, clean up uh, prescription drug labeling, which ultimately meant she had to come up with a new package design. And we figured this will never get through because the Food and Drug Administration... Uh, the government mm -hmm. agency, blah, blah, blah. But she persisted, and she came up with a remarkable thesis proposal and presentation. Uh, Milton was very excited by it, introduced her to uh, a colleague of his that had a connection to Target. Target was ready to open the doors to their new uh, uh, pharmacies, and they wanted something that would be a signature for them, and this became it. Wow, and, and and it's a, an amazing story and an amazing product, by the way. I mean, I have these on my shelf, and they're, they're, it's amazing to actually be able to find what you're looking for in, in your medicine cabinet, and and that's thanks to her. But you know, what's uh, what's she doing now? I mean, is, is has this turned into a business? For it her? has actually. She has a business with a, a it's a relatively small design firm, but with a few people working for her, and she's just doing uh, medical and health related products, which incidentally, are going to be very necessary as the baby boom generation starts hitting its uh, elderly spot. Ah, hmm. So do you think we'll see any uh, Stephen Heller design goods? And if you might see medicine in bottles that I'll be sucking on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the impression, Stephen, that, you, <laughs> that you're thinking a lot about aging lately, and I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I've, I've been through... Uh, uh, I've been through the issues with other people in the family, so I know what's mm. on the horizon. And it's something that designers really need to be cognizant of and contribute to. Uh, you know, service design, uh, product design, uh, package design in the healthcare area is going to be invaluable uh, to the providers and to the receivers. So, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot. I mean, I wonder what you think about, like, we, we definitely, obviously, live in a, in a culture, in a society that, that kind of worships youth, possibly in an unhealth, unhealthy way. And I think, though, we, can, we could say that the design industry plays into that. We, we have, play a substantial role in our, uh, our cultural youth worship. Um, do, you think, uh, do you think that that's a problem, and is there anything that we can do about well, it? Well, I think... You know, marketing is a problem. If you're marketing for a demographic and you're forgetting another demographic, it's not just design. I mean, it's the manufacture of medicines. You know, if you if there's not a large enough 
uh, group of people that need a particular medicine, they're not going to develop it because they're not going to make money. Mm -hmm. But I think designers uh, live in their time. And just a quick anecdote there. It's, my wife is a really amazing graphic designer, Louise Feely, and she used to use gray type a lot. Uh, and she would, and small. And she would also... Mm -hmm. I think we all did that. Yeah, at, at you know, point. the minute she got glasses or contacts, she changed to much bolder type. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, we follow uh, our lives uh, as designers. We use that as a touchstone. And I think that Sure, there are designers who are designing for youth culture, and they have to. And there are also designers who are designing for uh, an older culture. Uh, I, I, you know, it's it's how people ultimately market these things and uh, what the emphasis is. But I, with the baby boomer generation, I think there's going to be a lot more marketed to older people. That all said, I think our generation is different from certainly my parents' generation, because we're more youthful than our parents' generation. You know, my huh. kid, who's 24 and is a filmmaker, he would have been a graphic designer uh, if it was 20 or 30 years ago. But instead, right, his right. communication tool is film, video. Uh, and he's building, you know, a, an expressive practice based on that. Um, now, do you think you're, you you say that your generation is more youthful than your parents' generation was? Can you can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I think we, we the the culture is more monolithic than it was. I think when my parents were, you know, uh, in their thirties and the fifties, uh, it was a much more bifurcated culture. There was the youth movement, or there were kids, and then there were parents and uh, uh, discipline was different. Schooling was different. Uh, there wasn't. There was a clear delineation. I mean, I went to schools where you called the uh, the teachers and all sir and madam and miss, uh, mm -hmm. and then I ended up mm -hmm. in a progressive school where I started calling them by their first names, and that changed everything. It changed behavior. It changed attitude. Uh, it changed what the definition of freedom was. Uh, very simple things can make changes, and I think it also ultimately changed my relationship to younger people, to my, my own son. Uh, he's, he's as much of a friend as he is a son, and we share the same interest in some music at any rate, many films, some TV, some books. Uh, you know, there's a lot more sharing, I think, than there used to be. So you, uh, would you say that's changed design as well? I think it's definitely changed design because we're no longer totally designing for age groups. We're, uh -huh. Yes, as I said before, we're designing for demographics if you're in that business. But I think there's a more universal sense of design where you're just designing. You're designing for yourself in terms of that autobiography I mentioned and universalizing it, making it uh, applicable to lots of other people. At the same time, you have to define what your audience is, who your audience is, uh, and right. try to do the right thing by them. But I think we're much closer together. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, the pens or things like that, but uh, <laughs> you know, fashion, I still go into the Gap. I still go into uh, Banana Republic. That hasn't changed, and it would have changed for my parents' generation. Right, right. Well, Stephen Heller, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. I really appreciate your time. My great pleasure. Oh, well, thank you very much. An insightful interview, Mr. Mays. <laughs> I would agree, Mr. Adam. In fact, Josh, having Stephen Heller on the show was even better than that time you sent me a painting <laughs> after having a Bob Ross marathon weekend. <laughs> does that have to, I, I, I'll never paint trees the same again that's for sure if you'd like to send more uh, oil paints or a curly wig I'll take it address it to Josh I'll paint those trees and happy trees yep. and more happy trees forever I, I could use some of those skills myself we want to hear from you let, let us know what you think was that, that was, your impression of yeah, Bob Ross yeah it was a terrible terrible impression I was just you know trying to put you to sleep I guess 
It's I, could use, I could use some More. of those skills myself, Josh. <laughs> we want to hear from you. Let us know what you think. <laughs> who you want to see on the show and your favorite Bob Ross painting over at engineerversusdesigner.com or on the EVD YouTube and or Vimeo channels. And if you'd like to see us looking up at the ceiling thinking of witty comebacks, be sure to like <laughs> us. Plus one us, tweet us or whatever else us as social media has been correlated, staring off into space whilst getting very oh, little man, done. So true. This show was edited by the masterful <laughs> Simon Martin. If you love our taste in music and you want some more of that goodness, be sure to check out a new playlist on Solid Smack Radio every Tuesday at SolidSmack.com. We'll see you next week. And remember, without engineers, designers would still be painting with their fingers. And without designers, engineers would still be painting in MS Paint and, and are, oh, quite frankly. Josh, Josh is doing it right I, now. I see what you did right there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, I, I enjoy it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's therapeutic. It's kind of like... It's, tedious happy, but yeah, <laughs> well i mean happy tree there's exactly. if they added a happy tree button in oh paint, <laughs> game changer magical magical a production of ebd media